Thanks, Evelyn. I'm actually finally showing up for it. <laughs> <laughs> it's really bad at Julia Stanford because they report all of our lectures. I was wondering. And so students like the convenience not only of watching them at home in their pajamas, but then they can watch them on double speed. Mm -hmm. So, uh, not do a lot of pressure. And so, the audio still basically stands for doubles. So, the. Or they just go watch the board stuff and <laughs> slow it down. Like, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know how to understand audio. Yeah, how do you go about just following? I max out at about 1.5 if it's a topic that I already know something about. But, the player does adjust the beat, so it's not too much, but it's still obviously the So they, and they just say, you should just trust us. So, you know, I'm really convinced it doesn't work. <laughs> <A rainy day laughs> like, okay. You tell me to trust it. You're, like, you're the person who has 10 years. So I'll just go obey. So without recording, we're so, uh, implementing it. Right? Yeah. Next thing I do. <laughs> so, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming. I know it's full break, uh, but we still have a great turnout. Uh, I guess that means we care about teaching, which is good. Um, so, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Cynthia Lee. Uh, so, uh, she did her PhD at UCSD uh, in computer performance computing and is now a lecturer at Stanford. Uh, and she'll tell us more about uh, various strategies to incorporate active learning in our classrooms. Uh, thanks a lot. Hey, Anna, do we need to do anything to record? Are, we, are you recording? Yeah, we're going. Okay. I hope so. <laughs> Yeah, it's okay, uh, yeah, as I was telling some of you who were here a moment ago, uh, this is not pandering to the local audience. This is, in fact, the photo that I show myself on this slide every time that I do this talk. And um, this is also the slide that I show students to introduce myself to them at the beginning of the quarter. Uh, but that is me on Angel's Landing in um, Zion and Harvard. So, um, as you said, my research and PhD work was in market based resource allocation in um, large scale systems. and uh, since completing a PhD, I've been doing research in computer science education and publishing in that area. I taught for, uh, this is my fourth year, just starting my fourth year at Stanford, and before that, um, I taught as a lecturer in San Diego um, during and after my PhD work there. And um, I have also worked as a software engineer at a startup. And um, so, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about first what is a lecture and what is the role that it plays in our education of students, and then talk about what is different with a peer instruction lecture. And then we're going to give it a try, so I'll do a part of an actual lecture that I would give to students in a non-major CS1 MATLAB programming course. And then I'll talk about some of the research that I've done on active re uh, learning in lecture to evaluate the effectiveness of this as a teaching practice. So um, here's a photo of a lecture hall that um, probably looks similar to what some of you teach or learn in. And um, what I want to think about uh, when you look at this photo is what birds you would describe, I uh, used to describe what people in the photo are doing. And uh, 
it's easy to forget as an instructor because uh, even after many years of teaching, we still experience a little bit of stage fright, especially in a very large room like this. And um, we're speaking, we're thinking about what we're saying, we're thinking about what we're going to say next, we're thinking about am I going too fast or too slow, and what's that person looking at on their laptop over there. So there's a lot going on for us. There are many things that we can say that we're doing. And um, indeed, I walk out of lecture exhausted and drained. It's a very intense experience for us as instructors. But if you look at what everyone else is doing, it's easy for us to, as instructors to forget that everyone else is um, typically very passive. And, and there aren't a lot of interesting or active verbs that we could use to describe what people are doing. So, um, so when we think about what we do in lecture, we think about um, going back to the Greeks, uh, and we might imagine ourselves in these kind of starring roles um, of the greats, whether it's the Greeks or the greats of science, Carl Sagan, or in our own field, um, the way that Steve Jobs could command an audience with these very simple presentations. But, um, but unfortunately, students may have a different view of how, um, how we come across in lecture. And um, even if they're very interested in the topic, it can be difficult for them to, um, to not feel a little bit sleepy about it. So here's um, actually quantifying that. So this is a study that was um, done in, um, uh, in psychology where they instrumented students with um, a sensor that measures alterations in emotion, cognition, attention, and stress. And um, I am not an expert in this research area, so uh, I can't further address exactly what is being measured and how that relates to different things, but, but I think the patterns are pretty clear and a little bit disturbing for us as lecturers. So here are um, different days, and we can see the amount of activity that is going on for the student is actually quite a bit more during sleep than it is during class. So in fact, if students fall asleep during our classes, their cognition, attention, and emotion, and stress may be greater than if they're awake and listening to us. Sorry, what is the y-axis here? That is the activation of the sensor. So is this from the ring? Pardon? Sleeping, this, this peaks are from dreams? Yeah, I assume so. But, um, and what so was the, the, pardon? What was the sensor to monitor this? Did you have, like, the students wear a thinking cap during the whole time, during these five days? <laughs> totally. You'd think that would add to their stress and embarrassment and awareness, but, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm not actually certain how this is But what can encouraging about this is that we can see where students had a lot of activity going on, which is when they were working on homework. And that probably matches with our own experience that um, we may not have been particularly engaged in lecture, but what I recall, you know, my own educational experience, working on homework, especially if I was working in um, a study group with um, other students, then I was very engaged and I felt like that's where I really learned the material and really started to understand what was going on. And that is reflected also in this talk. So, um, so I'm going to talk about how um, peer instruction lecture is different. And um, in order to do that, I need to situate lecture in um, not just what happens in lecture, but how it fits in the context of the, uh, the, the whole process of learning. So um, typically, students will come to lecture and get their first exposure in lecture. The syllabus will have reading assignments on it. Uh, speaking from my own experience as a student, I very seldom, if ever, did the reading before class. I think that's pretty typical. So students are often getting their first exposure to the material in lecture. Then they'll think, that didn't entirely make sense. I'll go home, I'll read the textbook, I'll work on homework and really figure it out and really teach it to myself, essentially, and then um, return and show mastery to the instructor on an exam. So, uh, 
So a flipped classroom of peer instruction puts more of the, um, it just shifts around where this learning is happening. So um, students do need to do reading before class in order to get the very basic definitions out of the way. Um, I don't expect students to do uh, a ton of reading and studying on their own before class. I understand that that's pretty real and unrealistic. Um, but I do have a quiz before lecture that students can complete on the um, course management system. That is, um, it, the way that I write the questions is that if the students I pass over the one to three pages of the textbook that, um, that they need to read for the day, they should be able to answer the question correctly. And the software will do things like let them try again for a very small penalty. So it's meant to be very low stakes, but coming in, even having been exposed to that bold word, you know, um, key terminology and its definition, if that's all they get, um, before coming to class, that still gives me a more exposed surface area on which I can attach the information. So in lecture, um, the approach that I take is to say, okay, you've got the basic idea from the reading, but I bet this paragraph didn't make a lot of sense, or I bet this subtlety um, was something that you got tripped up on. So let's talk about that and let's drill deeper on. And then um, there's still homework, so it's not a fully flipped classroom in the sense that they only do homework in class. For, uh, for the theory courses that I teach, students do need to go and write serious long proofs, uh, and that is going to be something that they have to do outside of class. For programming, of course, you will not master the craft of programming unless you undertake some fairly ambitious homework assignments, and we still need those outside. So, <clears throat> who grades all these books? I mean, you have a bunch of them. So, I teach in school mathematics, so homeworks is also, you know, lots of books and so on. Uh, and then with 150 students, grading becomes really hard. Uh, uh, so, I don't know that I'm going to have a real satisfying answer to that question, uh, with, because my answer is I have an army of TAs. Okay. So, uh, I teach classes between 100 and 500 students, and I'll have between a dozen and 40 TAs. Oh, dozen TAs for 100 students? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, we have a pretty good ratio. Um, when I was at UC San Diego, the ratios were not as good, and so um, for the theory course, I actually had students do peer evaluation of each other's proofs. Not entirely for a grade, really more for the student's experience who's doing the evaluation. I can talk to you more offline about that. Thanks. Okay, so, um, so for this piece of lecture where we're tackling the hard part and we're doing it in a more interactive way, um, you can see the speaking bubble is applying to the students as much as it is in the instructor. There are a few different models that, um, that are out there in the education literature for how that lecture can proceed that all involve active learning and, uh, and student active engagement class. So um, Think Fair Share is a simple one. Um, some more um, highly structured, developed philosophies include problem-based learning and Hogel. The one that I'm going to talk about is peer instruction, but, uh, but I don't want to represent that that's the only way so um, peer instruction is, um, uh, is a specific label. It's not just uh, a label that means anything that involves peers talking to each other. And this is the um, structure of how lecture goes. So um, you would lecture for what we call a mini lecture, say about 10 minutes, and then um, stop for one of these activities. So students will individually consider and respond to a multiple <coughs> question. The um, slide there that I have is a question about DFAs that I actually use in the theory of computation course. And, uh, and so they will sit in silence for about one minute and answer this question individually. And then um, without showing them that graph, the histogram of their choices, I will then say, okay, go ahead and discuss with each other how you voted and try to come to a jury-like unanimous consensus about 
what you think the right answer is, and, um, and then they'll submit another response. Um, each student, again, votes individually, but the idea is that um, the group is supposed to have come to a unanimous decision. That forces them to really engage with each other rather than just um, idly say, well, we agree to disagree or something. Uh, and so um, then I will look at the second um, graph, and I will decide um, what I want to do at that point for an instructor debrief. So often I'll show them the two graphs and talk about that. I might solicit from the audience things like, well, I see there's a big shift towards B. Does anyone who initially voted A and then voted B want to tell me why they changed their mind or something like that? Yes. How, how big are these groups? Um, the groups, I think the best is three, but I would rather have more than two. And I've done um, assigned seating where the groups are randomly selected and, and assigned by me. And I've also done just whoever you're sitting near a more influential style. Do people kind of go and vote? I mean, like, lecture halls aren't really designed for the group stuff so much, right? So They're really not, right. So that's why three is good, because the person on uh -huh. each side of you, you can still kind of huddle together. Wider than four in a row doesn't quite work. Although I've done two and two in the lecture hall, um, and do, do people refuse? Are there sort of loners that don't want to be in groups that are sitting away from people, or do they get with the program kind of after a while, or what's the? So with assigned seating, that's oh, yes. I think easier because if it's randomly assigned, you feel obligated not to let the group members down, but if they're your friends or you self-select to. Um, sit with some kind of buffer around yourself, then um, it's easier. But but with just a little nudge of you're sitting next to two strangers, they are expecting you to be in a group. I've had very little problem. Do the writer students experience uh, watching pain drying? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so that's um, a problem in the classes with such disparate abilities, right? So the way that I explain that to students, and and some students are skeptical early on, especially the brighter ones, because they feel this, I don't want to be slowed down by others, is that uh, our, for example, our undergraduate TAs universally say that they learned the material when they started participating in the undergraduate TA program and had to teach it to others. And so it's the same thing, if the student's a little bit ahead, and then that puts them in the position of explaining to others, then um, they're not, even if they had mostly mastered it, it will really go to the next level of understanding when they need to explain it. Okay, so um, these two graphs that I showed, uh, one for the individual vote and one for the group vote, are in fact um, at actual votes from individual and group vote respectively. And so one thing I want to point out is that um, the B is the correct choice. But you can see it was not even the plurality choice with the individual vote. But then 80% um, of the students came to that conclusion after the group discussion. So this is a very encouraging sign, and this is something that I do see often in practice, that um, the sum can be greater than the part students, even though um, most of them did not get it right initially, are able to, um, in working through it together, coalesce around the right answer. Okay, so I want to give it a try now. You'll notice that you have papers in front of you that um, are these kind of QR code looking things. And um, the way that you go with these, you'll notice that um, your shape is unique um, with respect to everyone else, and in fact, um, you can rotate it any which way, and it will still not be the same end as anyone else's. And that is because rotating is how you vote. So you can see there's a tiny A on one side and a tiny B on the other. So you hold it up with the letter on top that is the one you want to vote for, then um, that is how you vote with these papers. And then my phone has an app that the camera will just scan the room. So I love these. I wish I could use them. Unfortunately, they only work for classes up to 62 <coughs> students, and I never teach a class that small, so I'm not able to use them. They do work great for me traveling and doing talks like this, though. 
because I'll show you, um, I used to do eye clicker, which is something that I use in the very large classrooms. It scales very well to hundreds of students. But when I bring my um, batch of 50 eye clickers on um, in a carry-on bag to do um, travel talks like this, uh -oh. the TSA, <laughs> so this is a photo of the TSA scanner when they um, applied extra scrutiny to my carry-on bag with 50 clickers in it. So, um, that is why I now travel with the papers instead of those. But, um, I put this on Facebook and my sister said, you're my sister and I still would have pulled you off the plane if I saw that. So, anyway. um, but I do, um, if you're interested in this technology, it's just um, it's clickers or paperclickers.com and they're easy and free. You just print out a PDF, cut each page in half. Okay, so we're going to do a little test of the technology to make sure everyone understands how this is working. So I'm going to pull up the app. <coughs> is the slide sufficient or do you need it brighter? Um, we'll see. So, um, go ahead and vote. <coughs> Or, um, have you used a classroom response system such as iClicker, Polyware, Socratic, or these paper reports? It looks like more light would probably help, but I'm, there we go. I'm So it does this really cool augmented reality thing. So you can see that it's showing what the camera is showing, but then um, hovering over each of your heads when I go past you is, um, is the letter that you voted for. So it's tallying them, but it also does this little fuss. I think it's really fun. And because it's unique, uh, if you, you yeah. scan me twice in one over one. Right, exactly. Like your fingers are on the pad in there, you wonder how. <laughs> yeah, so you could have students, so there's a number on there, like this is number 38. So you could have students tell you their number, and then you could go look in here and retrieve for a particular student how they voted. I typically don't care about that. I grade only on participation, not on correctness. So, um, so don't worry about that. But if you wanted to, for example, use the, uh, the fact that they had voted for 10 minutes or that kind of thing. Okay, so we have um, 10 of you voted A, 2 of you voted B, and 7 of you voted D, which is not a choice. <laughs> but, um, Way to go, team. So, <laughs> Alright, so, um, so I'm going to, as I said, give part of a lecture that I would actually do in our non-majors math math class. And I want you to play two ro uh, roles during this class. One is be a student again. So you will actually be answering the questions. You will actually be attempting to learn this. Uh, I like doing this lecture as part of this kind of presentation because many computer scientists actually don't know MATLAB. It's like the one language we skipped over because we thought it was silly, which it is because they index is one for their arrays. But, um, so um, be a student again. And then the other thing is I want you to look at the PI question design. So um, what are the key concepts for each question? Is it something we care about? If you're going to spend, you know, it takes about five minutes to go through the whole process of individual vote, discussion, group vote, debrief. So if you're going to devote five minutes of a lecture to a topic, it should be something that is um, a really core misconception about that day's lecture that students often have, or even something that matters. So think about that. And also think about what do we expect students to talk about when discussing each answer choice. So these are the two criteria that I use when I'm um, mentoring new faculty and adopting this teaching practice, is let's look at each question and think about, even if it's a, a tough question, but you sort of even know it or you don't, there's not much to say, that would not be a, um, a well-designed parent instruction question. So think about those two things as we're um, looking at this. So this is um, Welcome to Introduction to Programming in MATLAB. And I'm going to give you a very quick rundown of the day's lecture, which is about how to, um, the different modes of 
um, matrix indexing that are available in MATLAB. There's some nice syntax that makes it easy. And this would be, um, this quick rundown would be what you would get out of the reader. So, um, so this is not a slide that I would show in class, but um, I'll give you a different one. So um, if you have a matrix, you can um, give a row, comma, column um, in parentheses, and um, it will output that individual item for you. Um, it's one indexed, as I said, so if you want the very topmost leftmost element, that would be one comma one. And um, there's you, uh, an alias to conveniently talk about the last row and the last column is just the word n. So obviously you could put the number of the row and column there as well, but there's this nice alias n that refers to that. Um, colon selects a range, so you could have rows one through three um, using a colon, and then a colon by itself means the range all of that particular row or column, whatever category you're talking about. So, um, okay, so starting on today's lecture, I want to talk about um, matrices in a context that will make it easy for us to visualize what's going on. So we're going to use images. And so it's important to understand how computers store images, and that is that um, each uh, little piece of the image gets exactly one color that we choose for it. It's very similar to the perler beads that um, many people have used as children. So to a computer, images are simply a matrix of pixels that has row and column. And then each color is specified actually by three numbers that are a red, a green, and a blue value. So this actually corresponds to a third dimension of our matrix after row and column, and that is the color layer. So there will always be, um, that third dimension will always be size three, that we have a red layer and a green layer and a blue layer. And so if we look at the number, for example, the top left number in the red layer and the green layer and the blue layer, and combine them, that would give us the color of the top left pixel in our image. So, okay, now that we have that covered, I want you to think about um, which image would result from the following code signal. So the full rainbow.jpg is up there in the top left of the slide, and then um, we're showing part of that. And so the question is, which part? So go ahead and think about that um, individually, not discussing with anyone else. So go ahead and hold up your entrances. If you're still thinking that's okay, um, as you know, we always great for correctness, so just take your best guess, and then your groupmates will help you out. Yes. First index is row. 
The third one is your RBG, and so don't worry about that. That's the color value. All right, so now I'll go ahead and vote again. And I'm going to vote for the RBG. Yeah, I'm going to vote for the RBG. So each individual will vote again, but um, if you changed your mind in light of hearing from the group members, you will vote again uh, when you now believe the answer to And if you didn't change your mind, you still just vote um, again, even though you have not changed your mind. Okay, so we now have, uh, well, okay, before I tell you how the vote goes now, would someone like to report out what you talked about in your group? And especially if one of your group mates said something that really helped you clarify your understanding of this, you can uh, tell us what your group member said. Well, X and Y axis. We, we weren't sure which one is first, which one is second. Ah, right, because we have X comma Y, but Rho comma call is different than that. So we have to remember which one it is. We also had some confusion in your example. You had the rows being one through three, but you reported it as a as a row vector as opposed to a com mm -hmm. vector. So we certainly weren't sure what exactly was going on with that. And so that also confused us a little bit. Yeah. So um, MATLAB has this um, annoying habit of reporting out the vector always horizontally, even when it's reporting a row vector or as a column. So yeah. Uh, okay, so, so would anyone like to say specifically which letter your group chose and why? We chose C. Okay, you chose C, and why did you choose C? Uh, because uh, the first one you convinced me is rows, so okay. uh, if you take the first half of the rows, it should be the top half. Good, okay, and then... Um, so it is a useful technique. I think the thing you want to do when parsing these kind of statements is um, tokenize by comma, right? So we're going to divide this up um, looking. So there's a lot of syntax going on, but we want to just focus on the commas and draw big dividing lines there where the commas are, and then consider it. So um, the first thing is going to be rows, and then the next one, columns. And then what's going on with that final colon there at the very end? Yeah, so that is, when we use the colon, we're selecting a range, but uh, the colon is just by itself and needs to select the entire range. So we still want to select the R, G, B, and B layers, all three of them. Otherwise, we would see color distortion in the image. So, um, so we're selecting all three colors. And um, that doesn't change. So, um, okay, so we're selecting from row one up until n divided by two. So the top half of the rows. Um, you, you are a student in this class, probably have not seen floor before. So that's something we would talk about is what is that word floor there? And it just refers to um, evening out if the um, number of rows is an odd number, we want to select, um, we want to bring it back to an integer. So we're selecting the top half of the rows, so we would expect to see the top half of the image selected um, if we're doing rows one through um, halfway down. And then um, we're choosing one through n on the columns. We could have just had a colon there by itself, would have meant the same thing. But, uh, but that means we're selecting the full width of the image. So um, top half only, but full width is choice C. Any other questions? Okay. So you can see how now you will probably not forget ever, even if you want to, how to do um, matrix indexing in MATLAB, whereas um, just hearing the information, there was probably not a lot about this that stuck out to you as confusing and that you didn't understand at the time, but um, 
actually getting in and working with it um, now will um, be much more memorable to you. So um, I have uh, two more questions. So this is uh, seeing if we can push a little further and um, solidify our understanding with a slightly more complex question. So go ahead and consider this one. So how, so what was the difference between the first response and the second response? Oh, so it was um, about two-thirds of the class chose C and about one-third of the class chose D on the first vote, and then almost everyone chose C. Okay. Okay. Interesting about this is you can't peek at someone else's answer. Yeah. <laughs> so um, a common solution that I've heard from colleagues to not wanting to um, force students to buy a quarter device or have a phone, which brings up like financial equity issues and not every student can have a smartphone, is um, colored index cards. So you would vote red for A and blue for B, and so you have some you could even color code the slide by showing instead of letter A here, um, the color. So all you have to do is buy packs of three by five cards that are in the multicolored box. Um, the reason I don't like that though is then if you are the lone person holding up green, and you know it can be a little bit embarrassing. Whereas these, um, the letter is so tiny that people nearby you would never know, and they wouldn't know from the shape because everyone has different. About aspect ratio, what do people worry about? <coughs> no, true. Are the letters? They're not, not even, yeah, not. I mean, some, same letter could be here or here. I'm just watching. Are they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure. Oh, interesting. Consistent. I suppose you could um, crop them more um, evenly. But I have to put my reading glasses on to see how to vote. <laughs> ah, so there is um, a different PDF where the letters are larger on somewhat. <coughs> this is only an old guy. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. But they recommend it for um, the smaller children as well who can't read the really small. So it's it either end of this one. Okay, um, this one, we, would you like to discuss this one? The vote was fairly in agreement. So it's a very smart, fast learning class, so we can move along. Um, but let's do, um, let's do this one. So this one's fun. And 
And I'm going to let you discuss now because I bet you can figure it out. And that's something that a lot of instructors worry about peer instruction will slow the class down or how will I manage to cover everything. But you would be surprised how much you can get your students um, to figure out on their own in the groups. And that really keeps it moving a decent clip because they're able to teach themselves. So go ahead and discuss your So quick question. What are the PAs doing during this whole thing? So, um, I've had so, classes where I have the TAs come to class and distribute the throughout the room and kind of monitor if you want to be able 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 most of the time what I teach, I yes. don't so choose to allocate the hours to that. Exactly. And it still so works fine. Like it's Stanford, I've done that. The students are on the That would be mine. I was done the image processing and everything. Granted, I never went to the that. But, but my, my understanding is that's what would happen. I have maybe in the class of 264. So it's, we know that it's adult. It's got to do it. So it's Yeah. It's not a in there, it's just the first one and that's red. We don't have an E on our motor. It would be RBG, so that means no blue. If you're setting that to zero, that means that's Okay, so, oh, I revealed the vote to you before I did your group vote, which I'm not supposed to do, but pretend I didn't do that, and let's um, go ahead and do the group vote. Everyone voting again, whether you change your mind or not, you still vote a second time. We'll see what fingers are providing a small occlusion. There we go. Okay. So, um, so this was the before vote. We have two votes for A, nine votes for B, and ten votes for D. And the after vote is two votes for B, 19 votes for D. So, um, D should feel quite confident when someone who voted D in their group likes to explain um, the reason. Go ahead. So, first off, process of elimination. We know from the row and column that this is going to affect the upper left quadrant, leaving only B and D. Now we look at the third value. That's our RBG. MATLAB follows the same stuff, so RBG. This is referring to R meaning red. So we're affecting the red value. We're setting all red values to zero. So meaning there should not be any red showing up in this image. If you look at B, things are more red. This could either, that's an example, say, if R was set to the maximum value. But D shows all R values being zero because there's no red shown in that image. Very well explained. Yes, so uh, what we covered before was selecting the region, and so um, that was um, a skill we've already practiced. We're taking the first half of the rows in the first half of the columns, which is um, the upper left quadrant. So um, immediately you can eliminate choices A and C, as you said. And then the question is, what is going on with these RGB colors? So I have this little reference up here because um, the way that RGB color mixing happens is very not intuitive based on our uh, memories from kindergarten when you put red and green and uh, blue together, you get white in RGB, which is certainly not what happens with finger paints. You get sort of a brownish, blackish color. So, um, so when we see white in the image, that is because we have the maximum amount of all three channels, the red and the green and the blue. And when we take out the red, by assigning zero 
to um, only the red channel and the upper left quadrant of that red channel, then we can see that that corresponds to this little area of the Venn diagram there with the RGB color reference, that we have the maximum amounts of blue and green, but no red component, and that gives a kind of teal color which you see in the background here. And then the other clue is that the red stripe of the rainbow is absent, is black. So, yeah. I can have a question. Yes. How do we vote E? Ah, uh, so <laughs> that's a good question. When I use eye clickers, there are five buttons. And with the paper, there are only four. I like having that none other error. Um, and I'll, I can disclose to you as fellow instructors the reason why. And that is because when I am trying out a new question that I just wrote the night before for that lecture, and I mess up and none of the answer choices are right, because I'm like, this would be a disaster on an exam problem. And that's actually no problem at all for a peer instruction question in the lecture, because first of all, there is a right answer. It's that E catch-all one. And um, second of all, the discussion is really what we care about. And so we can discuss why none of the answer choices are correct. And then every once in a while, I do um, see that there's a stray vote in that category. And so I'll ask, you know, I see one person voted E, do you want to explain? And sometimes they'll have some really interesting things to say about uh, a different interpretation that they had of the language of the question, or uh, I don't know, it almost functions as kind of a, a signal to me like I have some interesting comment I want to make it, so. You know, for the right answer here, pretty clearly look at the red band going away and turning to black. But with none other error, you're also forced to examine your understanding of the cyan, whether that part's true or not, right? So like rather than sort of this process of elimination and maybe getting to sort of the easy answer, you kind of have to make sure you're not holding to it. Yeah, so the, um, the other thing is she that, that if more than language, one of them is correct, is an so if choice A students decide is correct, they would still have to consider B and C and D um, in order to rule out that it's not more than one of the other ones. Sometimes instead of none other error, I'll say none slash more slash other error. Did you teach this? Do you also introduce the fact that this expression can now be used as an L value? Because that's a concept that people need to get before they know that it can be assigned. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So it's um, this fact that you can have a region on the left-hand side of the assignment operator is very surprising to students. It's actually, you would be, it's less surprising to non-major introductory programming students than it is to us as computer scientists. I think. Functional programmers don't like this. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, we look at this and think, Oh, that's really surprising that you can have a whole region as an assignable value. But um, but in fact, that um, everything I think is to the intro student is so strange that that actually doesn't seem strange to them. But there is the question of um, they'll ask if it means that um, if their guess if, at what its meaning is correct, which is that it just replicates the zero in each slot. Um, but. Okay, so any other questions about this? All right, so I want to talk about um, some research on this. So you might think, okay, that was fun. There were rainbows. We learned stuff about MATLAB, but um, but does it work um, beyond um, being entertaining? And um, these are some research results that have um, been shown. Most of these research results are first in physics education. So the um, center of peer instruction has this um, structured methodology. It was Eric Mazur, who's in the physics department at Harvard. And, um, and so they're 15 years ahead on uh, research in that field versus computer science. But we've replicated a lot of these results and then shown new things as well in computer science. So we have um, improved conceptual learning, measurable learning during class, uh, reduction in failure rates for the class, improved retention of majors, and um, positive learning experiences as students feel like they have more feedback on their learning. So 
they're able to course correct earlier on rather than thinking, oh, that lectures, they all kind of made sense, and then bombing the midterm because they didn't realize that their level of understanding was very shallow. Um, so um, speaking of Eric Mazur, this is the um, classic result from his research, though he was teaching a calculus based physics class, um, introductory mechanics, and um, he taught it at first using traditional instruction, and then he has um, this great story. He has this wonderful video about um, uh, called um, "Confessions of a Converted Lecturer," and uh, he talks about some researchers came to him with a test of conceptual understanding of um, physics mechanics. So instead of saying this truck hits a wall and you calculate the exact something, it just says, okay, look, big truck hits a little car. Do they end up um, where they settle more to the left or more to the right or um, in the same place where they contact it? Just very simple questions that don't ask the students to calculate anything, but uh, but just ask them to reason um, about scenarios that are fairly easy to describe. So he thought, well, my students, all of there are these Harvard students, they all get A's on my extremely difficult final exam that not only um, ask them the simple version of the question, but also ask them to apply the calculus and, um, and actually calculate the forces. So he um, gave that exam to his students. And his first line of trouble was when one of the students came up to him halfway through the exam and said, do you want me to answer these questions based on what you taught us or just how I think about how physics works? And he's thinking, why are those two things not the same, right? So what have I been doing in the last 12 weeks if not helping you understand how physics works and impacting how I think physics works. Like if, there, if he hadn't had any impact there, then what really was going on? So the students bombed this test. They actually didn't do well, which means that they had pattern matched this plug and chug on the equations that he had given them without really understanding what was going on in physics. So he introduced peer instruction as a way to address that. And um, so he now gives them this um, conceptual test, the force concept inventory, at the beginning of the class with a pretest and at the end of the class as a post-test and uh, measured the learning base. And you can see that students um, were improving from their baseline twice as much uh, in the peer instruction classes is, um, as the traditional lecture classes. But um, you can see that over time he maybe also just started being a better instructor. So students um, performance was improving over time, or maybe Harvard admission just got more stringent over time. Um, so when he switched to um, a different style of class, algebra-based class instead of calculus-based class, that well, I'm redoing the curriculum anyway. Let me just go back to teaching a traditional lecture, not doing peer instruction, and see um, if I'm just such a better instructor now that students will still learn a lot even though I'm not doing this peer instruction pedagogy. And you can see that. Um, it was better than students were originally, so maybe he is a better instructor, but, um, but it was still not as good as what he was getting with um, peer instruction. So the pedagogy is what matters, not simply the charisma or skill or experience of the instructor. <coughs> Though we would like to think those things matter as well, but, um, but even holding the instructor constant, um, the pedagogy really makes a difference. Yeah. So I haven't read this paper, um, yeah. but it seems like the other thing that's really hard to tease out here is just the insight that you need to explain practical consequences of the equations. And that insight alone could make your score on this exam better if you weren't teaching sort of practical application of the formulas originally. That's hard to tease out. Yeah, um, and part of I think what you're getting at is something that he also describes, that he feels like the students often explain things better in their own language or in words that make sense for someone who's at their level of understanding that now that he's a PhD physicist at Harvard, it's just hard for him to quickly grasp what is it about this that's tripping you up and what could I say? So whether it's making the um, culturally salient 
um, reference for someone who was born in the year that I graduated high school, which I can no longer do, or, um, or just having that explanation that makes sense to a beginner from a beginner, that there's value there. Okay, so um, that was just his class, and you might think, well, Harvard's kind of an outlier in a lot of ways, but this is a study of um, 6,000 students across um, different classrooms in um, a variety of types of higher education institutions, and um, from community colleges to R1 schools and so on, and the performance on this force concept inventory, the standardized test in uh, physics, is uh, shown here. So the uh, higher the um, so this is um, class learning game. So the classes that appear over here are classes where students learn more, and the classes that appear over here are classes where students did not learn as much. And then the bars are histograms of um, number of classes of each type. The um, white is for traditional lecture, and the black is for peer instruction lecture. Um, the number of classes of that type where the learning game for that quarter fell in um, in this bucket. So um, you can see that there were only a handful of peer instruction classes that did as poorly as the best traditional lecture classes. And most did much, much better. So, um, so those are results in physics, and I want to show you some um, results quickly in CS. We're at 11. Should I? We'll do some, or we could just believe that. Yeah, sure. All right, we'll do it quick. So, um, so you might think, well, our students really learning from peer discussion. I showed you this bar earlier, where we had 35% of students have the correct response, and 80% had um, the correct response after each discussion. And you might think, well, maybe that just each group has one really smart person, and they said, uh, you should vote for B. So the students who vote change from A or C or B to B may not have actually voted for something. They couldn't then take that, what their neighbor said and apply that to a similar new problem because um, all that was transferred was the, the right answer and not an actual understanding. So that was a concern that we had looking at you know, what is very encouraging change in vote from individual to group, but may not reflect um, real learning. So. Um, so a group of, group of researchers in biology came up with this really cute um, um, experiment design that we replicated in computer science. Their paper was actually published in science, which I wish I could say that my paper was published in science, which it was not. But, um, but this was their, um, their experiment design. So they do the individual vote with um, a question. And then you have a group discussion, and then you have your after discussion vote. So this part of the process is what you've already seen in this um, presentation today. But then, before any of the votes are revealed, and before any discussion by the instructor happens, just immediately following the, um, the vote, reporting what happened after the In the second question, that has the same concept with the same difficulty, but it's just you know, different numbers, different scenario is different. And so the question is, um, if students were doing this kind of cheaty style, just vote for B, then we would see that that score on this new question is more like 35%. And um, if they were actually learning, then it would be closer to 80%. So, um, so we ran this across um, an architecture, computer architecture course, and a um, theory of computation course, and um, an average over many, many questions over the course of the whole quarter. And you can see, so this is the um, average vote on the first question. Average vote on the second question, it shows that huge leap that, um, that we know happens. And then you can see that their performance on the new question that's different than the question they saw before is much closer to the um, to the after group, so they actually are explaining to each other the concept. They're not just saying, 
So, um, we also have results um, for um, about 3,000 students examining um, getting a D, getting an F, or withdrawing over 10 years of UCSD, comparing um, nine different peer instruction um, instructors and uh, almost 30 um, standard lecture instructors. Oh, sorry. Many instructors in each category, and um, for many, many different classes. And this is um, showing each class individually, just sorted by the um, failure rates. So you can see there, there was this one quarter um, where this, there was a problem in this quarter where a lot of students um, failed and went through. But um, if we can draw a line there, that is the average of the standard instruction classes, and you can see that the failure and drop rates um, are lower for every single peer instruction class than the average of peer instruction classes, and that the average of the peer instruction classes is about on par with the absolute lowest um, drop rate for. We also have, um, again, looking at, well, maybe just the better instructors use peer instruction. We have instructors who taught both ways in different classes over, over the years. And um, even within instructor, you can see that on average their um, drop rate goes from 23% to 8% when they adopt peer instruction. Um, students really like it. You can base this across a whole bunch of Different. Oh, this isn't pending anymore. This was published, and I got a best case. Um, so um, these are a number of different schools, small, um, primarily undergraduate institutions, and R1 schools. A bunch of different languages, but they're all CS1 um, classes. And um, usually, you're in the high 90s um, on average of students who say that they wish other instructors would use this way. This one is outlier. And that was because um, this instructor created not only for participations in the different uh, questions, but also parents. And students felt like that put them on the spot, so they had a less positive experience. So, um, that is it. We have, if you're interested in trying this, but um, understandably a little bit reticent given the amount of work that it takes to. Um, to develop the questions, which I'm not going to lie, is a lot of work. Um, we have this website, peerinstructionforcs.org, um, that I started where we have um, instructors have uploaded full decks of slides for their entire um, semester that um, have all the peer instruction questions. So you can use those. They're all just um, Creative Commons license, freely available. Um, if you, any of you would like to donate any slides to that at any point, we're certainly um, still taking contributions to it. Any questions? So, again, in discrete math, <laughs> what I do a lot is um, write the problem on the board, uh, tell them, okay, try to prove it, then discuss the proof among yourselves, kind of in small groups. Uh, and then after that, I kind of saw it on the board and maybe answer some questions. Uh, so I do it a lot, all the time. And uh, really, there's no clickers there. So how, do, I mean, I can look at this website and maybe see your questions for discrete math, but I'm not sure how I would include clickers into like proof stuff. So everyone always says that. And um, I teach um, halting problems, undecidable diagonalization proof with clickers. That's okay. actually one of my favorite clicker lectures that I've ever created. Um, I'll give you a paper that I wrote specifically about the theory okay. of computation course. So it covers proof writing technique and then specific um, approaches to try to teach proof writing. And then I'm, I don't know how you do it here, but at um, UCSD we have the theory of computation is one course and the discrete math is a different course. Yep. 
And so, and I have slides for both of them. Okay. But I'll do I'll things be. like, um, this is the theorem that we want to prove, and it's um, like some kind of implication like if then. And so I'll, the multiple choice would be, well, um, uh, what should we take as given and what should we take as the want to show? Okay. Or so you can set it up that way, and then you just do your, your normal lecture where you do the rest of the proof. Uh, I've done the opposite where I'll do most of the proof, but then they just need to fill in one key part. Um, and yeah, so then there's all different ways. Okay. So I was looking at the website, and you know, you don't have an algorithm to there. And so I teach an algorithm to It's actually not even an undergrad, it's a grad algorithm class. There's 100 odd people in there. And we also have issues with proofs, but we're not dealing with proofs at the how do you write a proof level. It's more the question of how do you reason logically about this algorithm. And the proof writing is sort of secondary. In other words, you have to think logically about it, but your goal is to say something about the algorithm, not write a proof. And uh, I would have very much liked to see examples of how you teach algorithms in this model, but I haven't seen any. I don't know if you have any experience with that. Um, I haven't taught algorithms. I'll ask around with uh, kind of in the community and see if we have if anyone will pop um, up some slides specifically for algorithms. Some of the later theory of computation slides might provide at least a template for how you could approach it if you were going to write your own questions. We really are talking about like uh, reasoning about the Turing machines and different things. It's, they're expected to know how to do proof writing at that point. But, uh, but it still might be more in the mode of how should we set this up or that, that it's um, more than you would want for algorithms, but I can show you. And a follow-up question I had was, I mean, I, 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 mean, I see the effectiveness of these methods, but what I never hear is you know, how, how brittle the approach is to variations <laughs> in the conditions, right? So mm -hmm. you said you have between 12 and 40 TAs. So should I not, I mean, I'm, if I have 100 person class, I'm gonna get three TAs if I'm done. Should I not even bother? So, um, so I don't usually use TAs in class. Mm -hmm. I have at times um, had, so like at UCSD, I would sometimes have one or two. I think at most I had four um, TAs or undergrad tutors who would come into class and have them in and answer questions. But I also taught plenty of classes at UCSD and at Central. But the grading. Um, yeah, well for grading, but that part is whatever solution or lack of solution you have to that problem currently, that won't change, right? Because the homework piece, you would still be giving out probably the exact same homeworks that you're giving out and assessing them in the same way, I would imagine. It seems like you do more homework than that. Most of the time when I, so that's one thing that's nice about peer instruction is that if I come in and teach a class that other people either I'm taking it over for them or they will continue teaching it, which is often the case, right? Someone I teach primarily in the core. And so most classes that I teach, it's not, I'm the one person who will own that for the rest of my tenure at the university. And so I have to maintain a certain consistency with how other faculty are doing it. And that what's nice about peer instruction is that you're surgically <laughs> transplanting what happens within the four walls of your classroom, but there's not too much impact except for students are having to do a little more reading outside. So I keep the exact same assignments, I use the same exam questions, and so it's easy to show other faculty that we're still meeting the same standards and students are having the same kind of experience. They're just um, Failing and withdrawing at a much lower rate than they were before, but um, but I usually keep this consistent. Somewhat related, uh, what is your what are your views on using Python for accelerating education and uh, making people experience uh, certain problems in depth? So my experience has been that if you teach four or five simple functional primitives in Python, math, reduce whole, filter, all those things. With that, you can teach a whole ton of history, math, automated theory, a digital I Python notebooks, and then there is something that they can carry in play. Have you tried that? This also fills in other process needs by Python pipeline is ever present growing. 
I feel like I'm being tricked into wading into the perpetual debate of what is the right introductory programming language to teach students. <laughs> Should we also argue about Vim versus Emacs? No. <laughs> Yeah, I love right, teaching Python. in Python. I've uh, never been at a school where there was a consensus around using that for introductory classes. But um, but if you are using it here and you would like free instruction materials for it, we do have a really excellent um, set of materials for CS1 in Python that were developed by um, a close colleague at the University of Toronto. But, um, but I will... Uh, remain studiously neutral on the issue of okay. <laughs> what language you should use. Yeah. Uh, how do you, it seems to me when you're doing this experiment of traditional versus peer instruction, you're also flipping whether you're doing a traditional lecture or not. So just the question of flipping versus peer, how do you tease out those two effects? Uh, right, so if the control group, rather than being the traditional lecture, which I think it's been beat up enough at this point that it's um, sort of a straw man opponent at this point, um, versus the other things I listed earlier on, like Toggle and PBR and those. And I don't know that there have been good studies comparing across that way. Um, I like peer instruction because it seems like the least invasive change to um, to get things to work, as I said, with the same assignments and the same um, schedule. So Pogel, I believe, um, involves having uh, ideally a different room set up where students can really be working. And so, I don't know, that's I guess that's I, why I, can I refine, couldn't imagine a peer instruction, but... I can refine my question a little bit, because I'm asking, do I need to do this kind of work or this other thing? <laughs> Okay. I flipped my classroom, but what I do with the lecture time is we work through examples as a class. So I don't give as much opportunity for the students to teach each other, and I think that would be great, but I would have to do another level of restructuring to do that. So I'm trying to get a sense of, do I need to do this this week or maybe next year? Um, well, I wouldn't do it this week, but I think we should do it next week. <laughs> okay. I think I'm, I'm probably a dinosaur, um, so, but my lingering suspicion of some of this stuff is that with the limited amount of time I have with my students, that sort of cementing a low-level understanding of whether it's Time spent in class actually learning one small thing, it seems like it seems like the amount of content in the course goes down, but I'm sure I'm wrong. It's just not even wrong. Yeah, so it's fascinating to hear you say that because that's really, um, my body assessment as a student, as an instructor as well of lecture, is that it often functions as an announcement or a numeration of the topic that are fair game for testing that students should go learn elsewhere, as opposed to a time where students are actually learning it. And it is true that, um, that homework assignments and other things outside of class are still necessary to really learn it, but I think there are a few things where, um, where my contribution of making a well-crafted question that calls their attention to a nuanced corner to the theory for or um, an important um, pattern in a programming course can help students really understand something that they won't be able to make much progress on their own without understanding. And so I will spend you know, lecture, you're still doing 10 minutes of lecture and then punctuating it with these activities. So there's still time for you to say, this is 
uh, what I'm doing right now and, and go over some of those enumeration things. But for every lecture, I think there are probably about three things that I think this is really important and I want to dwell on this and I want to make sure that we have some safety data on the back that we're not moving on the back. carefully selected three things have to be um, things that you feel are real priority for you and, and that's what I use as a measure of what should I ask your instruction questions about. How much of this do you think is a function of the tight feedback loop versus the peer instruction part? Like you just deliver questions without your stuff, I mean are comparisons for that? Right now, if you get lecture, do the homework, and then you wait three weeks to get some, you know. Right. So this, um, someone else asked about kind of what's the prudentness of the model. And this is something that um, that has been started to explore um, in research by some of my colleagues about, well, what if we um, do the quickers, but we skip the discussion? Or, um, you know, what if we don't do the whole reading before class and quiz thing. You know, what parts of this model can you move and still achieve at least most of the and, uh, and that's still very much working in progress. But um, and I can speak to what I do in my own practice, and that is that the different courses that I teach are on the spectrum between very light version of peer instruction and um, and heavy use of peer instruction is probably more than for example air or So the theory course, if you look at my slide test, there are almost no expository slides whatsoever. They are just question after question after question. And so um, I'm verbally giving the exposition as a debrief to each question. But, um, but I'm not doing the model where I'm giving a very traditional expository, expository lecture for 10 minutes and then doing the question. We're really working through it together. So that's kind of at one extreme. And then um, at the light end, for me, is actually the course that I'm teaching right now, that's introductory systems. We do C programming and we look at the x86 translation and a little bit of like memory hierarchy and that kind of stuff. And uh, we all put up multiple choice questions, but I don't ask students to bring any kind of clicker or device. I just ask them to look at it and think about it, and then talk to your neighbors. I'm not assigning to you, I'm not doing reading ahead of time, I'm not doing reading ahead of time, um, and I'm not even um, collecting the books. So the downside is that I'm not seeing which percentage of the class is getting the question right or wrong. So, um, so it's a little more boring than, than I would like, but um, with the kind of politics of who also teaches this course and how it's been done, how it seems like the right solution for this class was to keep the questions and sometimes do discussions, sometimes not, but it's a very lightweight application of And um, so that, that's what I do in my practice, and I feel good about it, and I feel like students are still benefiting from it. And I certainly think that some active is better than others. So when I'm mentoring new faculty, one thing I'll tell them is, even if you don't want to write questions, and you just, all you've ever seen is a traditional lecture, and someone's going to hand you their slide deck, and you're a new um, tenure-track faculty hire at an R1 school, and you just have to focus on your research, and you barely have time for teaching, at least do this. Every eight minutes, set a little timer on your watch. Just stop and tell the students, for the next two minutes, talk about what we've talked about. And just see if you can identify what was the most important idea in what we've talked about for the last eight minutes. And so, so you're not writing a quicker question, you're not doing a device, you're not grading, you don't have to make a 5% in your syllabus or did they participate in your instruction questions or not. And just doing that, it, is, it even has a name. It's called the two-minute pause procedure. And, um, and that alone, I think, is much better than not doing that. So I'm a, a big fan of something is better than nothing, and not being a real zealot about if you're not doing it exactly this way, then it's not worth doing. 
So we should probably stop here. Uh, <laughs> thank you. And I believe there was some announcement about like a copy with you following this. Do you think about this? Oh, or? so um, oh, go ahead. I had asked to meet with if you have um, like a diversity club in your department, like women in computing, or we have a society of black engineers that I like to ask to meet with those groups wherever I go. So but the meeting is set up for two weeks. Yeah, and it's already people are already probably there. Mm -hmm. uh, that was very right. right. Look. That was at 11? I thought it was 11 for Yeah, I also was chatting with Tammy through email. So well, David just said they seem to get to two free copies of the book. Yeah. So I expected. I don't know. Oh, I did think it, it was not right at 11. And I also thought, no, yeah, it might be right. I also thought the email went out more to public, but not specifically to like software women engineering or yeah. I don't know what's going on so I, 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 know, I, know, I know the answer. Uh, I've been communicating with Tammy and uh, <laughs> okay. so I offer you I will take you to two weeks. Yeah. Okay. Oh great, yeah. thanks. Yeah. I don't yeah. have anything yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. and then I will have a follow up with uh, Cynthia for an hour if uh, possible. Yeah. Okay. 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 Should yeah. I turn off the Yeah, let's do that. And the project uh, they are recording also. Yeah, yeah, thank you. These are great. Are these funny? Yeah. So, it's under the